Well, thank you for joining me for this uh, end of the morning session with the corporate forum here in San Diego. Um, I, put a, I put a little poster up here on the left for the questions and polling. I don't know if you were here for Rachel and Pam's lecture, which was awesome. Um, but you can actually use your phone and, and uh, we'll do some questions if you want to post some questions or I think I have a few slides on polling that we'll do. Uh, but I want to first off thank Austel and the organizing group for Austel for uh, inviting me to come here and spend some time with you to talk to you about how we use Austel in our practice. Uh, we had a great lecture uh, just prior to me by Pam and, and Rachel on how they use it in their private practice. In, in Denver. Um, mine is a little bit different. Uh, I come to you from the University of Florida. Uh, we have an implant center there that was founded in 1999. Uh, we have a wide range of patients that we treat and we have a whole team of, of individuals that, that work alongside me in this clinic. And when you have multiple end users uh, working in the same environment, there are definitely parameters and practice guidelines that you want to put in place to maintain quality levels. So there's a whole team of individuals behind me in, in working on a daily basis that I want to give recognition to, but also uh, give you an idea of, of what goes into our practice and in, in treating our patients. And um, we have an active faculty practice. We see patients five days a week. Uh, so I go in, I, I treat patients from eight to five, and on top of that I find some way to teach dental students about implants. Um, we find some time to set aside to do clinical research. We don't do much with animals. Uh, most everything is clinical research trials. We're getting ready actually to start a five-year prospective trial on the tapered implant design in immediate sites, which the, the Ostel unit will be integrated into our measurements. And um, the faculty in the center spend weekends giving continuing education. I've been very blessed to be invited to the AO on several occasions over the years and, and definitely enjoy coming here and sharing uh, my experiences with colleagues from all over the world. Uh, so this is a little bit of the makeup of what we do on a weekly basis. And um, one of the key ingredients uh, of the implant center is generating revenue and helping patients with their problems. So the faculty practice is, is one of my passions and something that is, is very integrated into what we do. So we treat patients very much like you treat patients in your practice. And there's, there's three types of patients that make up what we're doing right now. Uh, we have the patients that come to us uh, that are there for initiation of care. The, so this is a patient that may be walking through the hospital that doesn't really have a dentist and they, they break a tooth. It's a very straightforward, limited type of treatment um, that, that we, we see often in our practices. Um, this makes up a small portion of what we do, but we do have some of those patients in our practice. And, and, and Pam and Rachel highlighted that with several other case examples of uh, patients coming in, wanting accelerated treatment. How long can you, uh, how long is it going to take to get this tooth out and get something in I can get back to work on and, and, and function with? So we've all been pressured in our practices with accelerated treatment protocols. Right, And there's a lot of us that have been intimidated by that because we feel that we may lose patients if we don't do accelerated treatment protocols. And, and what is critical, then if we're going to try to expedite this treatment, we want to, get, we want to maintain quality, we need to use tools in our, our, our arsenal to make sure that we're doing it right. So this is, this is a big, big part of what we do in our practice. The, the, next, the next area is the referring in of patients that are either too complicated um, for clinicians in that region, uh, either due to medical risk factors or treatment um, uh, risk. Uh, so this, is a, this has always been a, a big part of our practice. Now, if you have a very active implant practice, you may see this patient, and I'll show you their treatment later. And, you, you, you lick your chops for it, but we have many clinicians that are, that are struggling to do this type of treatment, so they refer these patients in for comprehensive care, and they come in and looking at their, their treatment options, and they have a, a desire for expanded treatment alternatives, whether they see a commercial on TV and want teeth in a day, or um, they hear about implants and what they can do to improve their quality of life. Uh, but they're usually more advanced and complex and, and better handled with a, a team of individuals that, that take on their treatment. 
Now, one of the biggest areas that we're focused on right now, though, unfortunately, is complications. I would say that um, over the last seven years, I've had uh, probably a 40% increase in consultations and complications uh, in our practice. We usually had about 20% of consults, consults would be complications, and now we're over 50%. Our patients that have had implants placed and they're having some type of issue with these implants, and we're, we're, they're coming to us to find some way to fix it. And, and the reality is this number is only going to increase. This is going to be a big part of all of our practices if you embrace implant dentistry. And these patients are usually coming in, in in a difficult situation. They're either in pain, they're infected, they can't function with their prosthesis, and they're finding a way to say, can you help me get through this problem? And we have a need in this to assess the health of the implants. You know, if you're a restorative doctor and you have a patient come in that has implants placed, by someone that you don't know any history of and they're having a problem with their prosthesis, how comfortable you are you proceeding and working with those implants to place your prosthesis on there. Uh, the, so there's a big need for us to be able to go through a protocol and assessing the health of the implant and, and electing to proceed with a new prosthesis or tied in with some other um, therapy. So these are the, 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 bi the, the three patient populations that I'd like to talk about today. And the key thing is, is I want to share with you how we use the OSTEL a device within our toolbox in treating these patients. And, and I would never want to mislead you and say, all we need is the OSTEL, and it's going to tell us everything we need to do about this implant. You know, Pam and Rachel were very clear in showing that their skill set plays a role in it. There are other parameters that they read on implants play a role in. The OSTEL is just one device that, that comes into play. Um, when assessing the, the stability and health of this implant. So what I want to start off with is talking about some clinical techniques that we use to measure implant stability after defining what's important with implant stability. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the OSTEL technology and the te techniques that I've learned in our practice in, in making it work right. Okay, so if you can imagine, we have residents that come in our practice that didn't read the manual, just sit there and go, go away and try to start using this thing. So I have plenty of, of complications just in using this device that I want to share with you. And, and then I'm going to talk to you about how this OSTEL works in our practice as far as clinical decision making from a loading protocol standpoint, um, from a treatment approach, and then that last one, dealing with patients that come with complications assessing implant health. So that's my goal for the, the next uh, a lot of time that we have here. So let's first talk about techniques used to measure implant stability. Now we're going to go way back to Professor Bonamark and his uh, publication on osteointegration. I mean, uh, my life is so centered around this right here. I mean, I love implant dentistry. I love what we can do for our patients. And, and I can't do it without something that is rigidly fixated to the bone. Right? So everything we do is, is tied to this definition. And actually, over the years, it's been modified. So Albertson came out in 94 with a modification to uh, the definition of osteointegration. And then um, Gekeli came out in 2012 with their definition of implants to uh, osteointegration. And, and when you sit here and you read these uh, different definitions of osteointegration, there's something that actually resonates with all of them. And that is the fact that they're rigidly fixated, they're stable in bone, right? We want something that is just fused to the bone. We want something that we can um, anchor our prosthesis to, right? So um, that's our main goal. If we have an uh, anchor that is not stable, then we run a risk of losing that support for this prosthesis. Now the reality is, you know, I used to explain to patients, an implant is like a pole in a bucket of cement. I mean, it's fused in there, we can anchor to it, but there is a modulus elasticity of bone, there's some micro motion that occurs within implants that are physiologic uh, acceptable, and that's anywhere from 50 to 100 microns. But once we move beyond that, we run the risk of a, fi a fibrous encapsulation of the implant and failure of that implant, all right? So we need a method 
to assess the micro motion and the stability of the implant to make sure that it's going to be in a healthy state long term. That's, that's, that's our main goal um, with the assessment of implants for osteointegration. And, and we were talked about earlier about primary stability and secondary stability. And this is a graph that's a little bit different than, than the one that they showed in their presentation. But you can see here that the primary stability is just a mechanical retention of the implant. All right, and that occurs at the time of surgery. And what influences that, that stability? Well, the, the quality and quantity of bone, for sure. We spend so much time augmenting deficient sites to make sure we can get an implant in an ideal position for restoration. But you, when you talk with your colleagues, you start to get into the implant design playing a big role in stability as well. You know, I know the question came earlier about you know, what is a, what is a excessive torque to place implants at, and I've seen some implants go in with very low torque and, and some other implants with aggressive thread pitch that kind of you talk about binding into the bone and if you don't tap the bone you're in trouble. And, and the implant design can play a role in that. And we've seen areas in the mouth where some work better than others. In addition to that comes the surgical technique and the expertise. Right, so I have a, a colleague that, that had a, a 195 implant month on January. That was a good month. Um, I think he's pretty skilled at placing implants, and I think he's, he's pretty knowledgeable at um, stability parameters if he's been that successful in placing those implants. Um, but I have a bunch of residents that haven't placed a single implant. And when they're preparing that osteotomy, their hand's shaking like a leaf on the tree. Not that osteotomy is not three and a half millimeters when it's done, it's a little bit larger. And no matter what implant we choose, there's gonna be a compromise in that. So the surgeon's experience and skill set plays a big role in primary stability. We get wide ranges with it. Now when we talk about secondary stability, that is now the biologic conversion, you know, the, the growth of the bone, the apposition of the bone against the implant and giving us that stability that you see that rises over time. Now I would love to say that we can design an implant or a situation where we have high primary stability and it just is a straight line straight into secondary stability. We never have to worry about stability being an issue, but that's just not the reality. Our whole goal in implant design, surface technology, um, in, in the, the mannerisms in which we place implants is to reduce this dip. You hear people talking about it, reduce the stability dip improve the primary and secondary stability and we decrease the potential for failure. But the reality is the, the stability is going to decrease before it increases and that's why you see some dips in ICQ values over time. So um, a, a, a secure primary stability is a key factor in getting secondary stability which enhances osteointegration. So I have a question for you. In your practices when you plan implants you're going to have different methods in which you measure stability. I've put them up on the screen and we're going to do a, a, a survey right now to see what methods are most common in your practices and how you determine uh, stability. Do we have that question? Now obviously um, there is not just one method. We use multiple methods, but do you have one that is more pronounced than others that you use in your practice? My numbers are lower than yours. We're at five, okay. Am I lecturing to a room full of Austell users? Am I? Or am I lecturing to people that are interested about the technology? Because then we can just go a different direction and share our experiences. Um, well, so we can see here that, that most of you are using the RFA that, that, are, that are in the use in the room, but I would, I would venture to bet that you're also using probably placement torque values, referencing radiographs. I mean, you're going to use a multitude of things in assessing primary stability. Um, but the, the, IR, the RFA analysis is one that, that has shown uh, to be quite um, uh, a, a standard protocol that we can use in our practice. Let's just talk about the advantages and disadvantages of these real quick because radiographs 
are non-invasive, and they're the actual only method of assessing potential stability um, from at least a radiographic analysis that's prior to implant placement, right? So you can do it before, at the time, or, or after. The, the problems with radiographs are um, it's, if you're using plain film radiography, you can't see the bone in three dimensions. There's a delay in the demineralization of bone, right? So you may see a lucency in an area in a, in a site that clinically you saw there was bone, but it, it's demineralized. Uh, so there, there's some error in that process of using a radiograph to assess at the time of implant placement. You have limited views. If you have a, uh, someone that's not really tuned to taking good radiographs, you have distortion that can really uh, introduce error. So radiographs are not the best way to, do, uh, to assess stability, but it's one of the tools that we use. I think one of the most common ways we assess it in our practice prior to using RFA is the cutting torque or the placement torque values. But understand that this is something that's done once. This is the, done at the time of surgery. You can't do it anymore. And we know that stability changes over time. So the, the placement torque values will be good for just assessing maybe should we proceed with immediate loading play role in loading protocols or not. Maybe it takes a, a, a place in, in whether you restore versus load the implant or, or just place a healing cap. So it does have a positive correlation to the bone quality and density, but not as much um, to the longevity of that implant. I've seen stable implants fail, and I've seen implants that we've kind of pushed into place and crossed our fingers integrate, right? So um, there, is, there is some limitation to that. The reverse torque test. Now, we were having fun at dinner about this last night. I, I came to the University of Florida in 1999 from Baylor. Uh, my surgeon, uh, Jim Ruskin, was placing a, a rough surface implant, an SLA implant. And um, since 1999, I don't think we've ever done a single reverse torque test. It doesn't make sense to me, um, especially what, how do you time a reverse torque test? It's a, it's a sheer um, method of, of testing the integration of the implant and you may damage bone that is still healing. So we don't do reverse torque tests. Uh, it doesn't give you a, a, a quantification of, of the degree of osseointegration. integration. Um, it is a method that I think some clinicians would utilize just to try to make themselves feel better before releasing a patient. But if you bring them in and you place a reverse torque on and the implant spins, now you've just prolong the healing period, and you've doubled or tripled that healing period before you're ever going to release it to the patient. So reverse torque testing is something that we don't incorporate into our practice um, treatment protocol at all. But you, I could guarantee you that if a patient comes in with a symptomatic implant, what do we do? We tap it. What does it sound like? Does it have a, a, a tingy sound or, or the thud? Right? And that's something that is very commonly done is some type of percussion test that we want to tap on that implant and feel that does it sound like granite? Are we getting that tingy sound back? And this is a nice um, a test that can be done to give you instant feedback, but it's, it's, a, it's a test that has no quantification. It is, it is just an observation and, a, um, and a, a simple method, but it's very subjective. Uh, and if I have a, you know, if I didn't clean my ears that week, I don't know if it's going to be as tuned in as if I, you know, had a, a, a good cleaning there. So it's something that you just kind of take into play of, of one of the, the parts in that whole process. Now, and this is where we come into the resonant frequency analysis. And this is a non-invasive approach that can be done at the time of placement. It can be done at later stages. In our practice, we do a lot of screw retained restorations. It can be done throughout the use uh, uh, in life of the implant because we have retrievable uh, restorations that give us access to the implant. And that's important is, is the, to get an accurate RFA, you're going to want, be wanting to use the same location um, of those measurements over time. Uh, but it's going to give us a, an idea of implant stability tied in with the, the bone density. And um, where you get the most powerful use of an RFA is when you have multiple measurements over time. Okay, so that's an important thing to understand. So let's talk a little bit of, about this technology. Um, you've heard the term tuning fork, and it's not far off from that. This is the non-invasive teeth that, uh, technique that uses an instrument to pro promote vibration to this peg that's placed into the implant, and it's going to measure that micro motion um, that Pam talked about earlier uh, in, in a, and give us this numerical value 
in, in ISQ, but what the RFA is actually doing is getting a Hertz reading. But these Hertz readings won't really work too well for us. So Austel's converted these Hertz, Hertz readings into a value or of significance that we can um, hold on to, and that is this implant stability quotient. Uh, we, like, we like charts, we like scales, we like numbers, and this one is one that ranges from 1 to 100, um, but it is not a linear table. And that is a very important thing to understand, is that we have a gap there within it where the stability increases dramatically um, from 60 to 70. So I was thinking when Pam and Rachel were talking about the different cases they were treating, I, you know, a, a jump from a, a 61 ISQ value to a 65 is pretty significant. I mean, that is showing some, some big growth improvement versus 51 to 55, right? So um, when you get in that window of 60 to 70, you're, if you're in moving in the upward scale, that's a very positive move in that, okay? So that's something that you need to take into consideration. Now, not much was talked about the smart peg. Uh, this smart peg is made out of a soft aluminum material. It has um, a zinc coated magnet on the top of it. This is a delicate measuring device. And I can tell you when we moved from the previous Austel uh, measurement into the, the, the ISQ and now the IDX series, and we've started using these smart pegs, the first thing you think about as a clinician is can I reuse them? You know, can I sterilize them? Can I cold sterilize them? Um, and, and I thought the same darn thing. I thought, man, if I can use these multiple times, that's going to reduce the cost quite a bit. The problem with it is these things oxidize quickly, and because it's a soft aluminum, um, and once you place these and remove these multiple times, even if you found a way to cold sterilize them, you're damaging that connection, and that's going to influence your ISQ readings. Okay, so it is single patient use, and what that means is if, if I have one patient replacing multiple implants on, we'll be using that throughout that patient. Now, I know some clinicians that try to hold on to it and use it later on that patient, but it is not, it is not designed to go through a sterilization process, okay? And, and, and that's an important thing. This is, this is your actual measurement device. This is the key principle in getting accurate ISQ readings. So I was walking into the surgical suite the other day, and a um, young surgeon, they extracted a tooth, they placed an immediate implant, and there's a Dr. Martin, we're getting, we're getting an ISQ of 10 here. I, I don't know what's going on. And I said, well, how did it feel, you know, when you took it out, did it have a full socket? Yeah, the socket looked great. And how did it feel in the preparation? Well, we, we prepared it well, and, and there was good resistance when we were, we were placing it. And we had a, a torque placement of, of uh, I think, 25 to 30. And I said, you're getting a 10. That's not making too much sense. And, and this is a thing. Don't, you, don't, you don't just kind of like, they're, they're, they're freaking out because this is a 10. And I said, let's step back and look at why is it a 10. Is this the right smart peg? Well, uh, it's what they handed me. Did you ask for the right smart peg? And, and if you have the wrong smart peg in there, you're not going to get a good reading. And they had a smart peg of the same implant system, but the wrong model the wrong design, and it was giving an, a, a reading and not just giving a, a, a noise. Sometimes you'll get this noise type kickback. This is, was giving us a reading that made the implant look like it wasn't stable. So common sense plays a role in this process. You wanna make sure that we have the right parts and pieces in place. And then also what you wanna do is because you're exciting that magnet and you're getting resonance back, you wanna make sure that you are continually doing it in the same method. Right? So if you're a single user, always take it at the same angle and the same positions and repeat that over time and that's going to eliminate any potential error. So in the, in the standpoint for what I want to do with my residents, we work very hard to get 90 degree angles. So I know that everybody's taking measurements, we're all taking them at 90 degree angles and then we definitely are going to position that at the magnet level and not at the base. So these are simple things that we do to help keep consistency in that process. So when I look at the notes and I have a patient that's coming in with an issue, um, I wanna assume that these readings are accurate and have been done right. So let's go back to the, this, this stability chart here. What factors influence you when you choose to load the implant? What are we looking for when we're coming up to this secondary stability and whether we choose to load it or are we gonna load it at the time of placement? We had some great examples earlier with the, the ISQ readings. Let's just kind of look at it from a different perspective and, and use a little 
um, literature that came from Gallucci's group. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of, of an organization called ITI, and in that organization we do consensus conference proceedings, and Herman Gallucci out of Harvard did a great systematic review of loading protocols. And, and, and I would encourage you to kind of pull this, this supplement out of Jomi um, because it, it goes into much more depth than I can share with you. But they broke it up into single sites, partially dentate unilateral sites, um, completely edentulous fixed sites and edentulous sites. I don't have time to go over all that, um, but I'm going to I'm going to pull some of them for you. So um, the definitions we have: immediate restoration, immediate loading. Now, one of the things that you you can always embrace in your practice, if you want to put a tooth on there but keep it out of function, you can do immediate restoration, and that's what it is. Put in restoration to start in the tissue shaping process. We're keeping it out of excursive movements. Um, keeping the patient off of it from chewing, or we can load it and put it into function. This is usually one week after implant placement. So it's within that first week of the high primary stability. And what factors come into play when we do that for single implants? So I'm going to talk about single implants right now, is we have to assess primary stability. We have to feel first, all right, I got an implant that's stable. And if we were measuring the insertion torque, a range from anywhere from 20 to 45 newton centimeters gives us a, a, a second confirmation that we have some good stability to it. And then an ISQ of anywhere greater than 65 to 70 would make us feel comfortable in doing an immediate restoration or immediate loading of a single tooth. Now, the, the common sense part is the benefits have to exceed the risks. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little bit like Rachel. I mean, if I got a first molar back there, I'm not rushing to put a tooth on it. What's six weeks? You know, um, what's eight weeks? It's, it's not that big. But if we're working the aesthetic zone, we're working with high aesthetic risk, we're working with someone that um, we want to initiate the shaping, um, that this is a, a key factor that comes in, that we're, we're looking at the, the, the benefits exceeding the risks. Now, the patients that are excluded from this are patients that we graft, patients that we would want to kind of close, um, uh, submerge this implant because of some type of augmentation, or if we have some kind of contraindication where the patient's not compliant, and the patient's a bruxer, they have parafunction that we can't protect. So these are the placement parameters from that. Now, when we go into early loading, which is probably the biggest part of our practice, or anywhere from one week to two months after implant placement, um, you can see we're in a very difficult part or a very uh, risky part of that, that stability process within the implant. So we still, for single implants, we're looking for primary stability, we're looking for ISQs greater than 60, and we want to make sure that the benefits exceed the risk. Now, I would say in our practice, this is our window. I, I, don't, I couldn't tell you if I've ever loaded a single tooth at one week. If, if, if it's not being done immediately, it's being done anywhere from six to eight weeks later. It's been routine in our practice. But when we do simultaneous augmentation, we have contraindicating factors there. We'll pull off from this and, and wait till we have something that is, is definitely more stable. And then um, we move into the conventional loading. Is anything greater than two months? In, in our practice, again, in single tooth sites, I would say that conventional loading makes up 10% of our practice. Early loading makes up a very big, large point. And, and if, you're, if you're in your practice now and you're waiting four to six months to load all your implants, you're missing the boat. You're, you're, with the implant technology and the surface technology that we have today, tied in with ISQ, if you needed that one little feature to help you feel a little more confident, um, eight week to 12 week loading is, is very routine in, in your practices. And think about the number of patients that will commit to treatment not having to wait four to six months um, to, to get their restorations. Now we have those patients that are on the, the, the borders of the bell curve that, that are gonna wait longer, but a vast majority don't fall into this, they fall into our early loading. Let's look at this the same for the uh, edentulous fix, because that's a very popular area. So um, when we do immediate rest, it's, you know what, I should have removed that, because you can't do immediate restoration in edentulous arch, right? That's going to be immediate loading. So that's my, uh, my typo right there. It's going to be loaded. It's going to be cross arch splinted, and it's going to be something that's tied to primary stability with our implants and having the insertion torque of greater than 30 newton centimeters tied with an ISQ greater than 60. You can see the ISQ number is a little bit lower because we're gaining the, the splinting from the multiple implants in that situation. 
Um, but what is important is implant number and length plays a role. You probably want longer implants, around 10 millimeters is, is long in my practice. Eight is much, very common. And, and implant numbers are going to play a larger role. Obviously, more numbers um, is going to be beneficial over less. Um, same thing with the exclusion when we're doing grafting and local contraindications come into play with that. Now, when we move into the early loading, um, we have the very similar type of, of factors, but also insertion torque at that point doesn't play much of a role. We're in our secondary stability at this point. So we're looking at ISQ numbers to really dictate that process on how we're going to move forward. Okay? And then conventional loading at that point is uh, we're just looking for a stable, improved ISQ value and we're just counting on secondary stability and integration of these implants. And, and again, in our practice, I probably couldn't tell you the last conventional loading, uh, probably the last one I did, did was a zygomaticus case. Um, so that's an implant that we don't do immediate loading on. I know others do, but we've waited a little bit longer on those. Most of our patients fall under the immediate loading and, and early loading. So let's just use the last few minutes to talk about some different cases. In our practice, I think one big benefit is education of our residents. Okay, so we have clinicians that have no history of placing implants, no history of preparing osteotomies. We want to give everything in their power to give them tools to assess primary stability. So we're going to embrace everything we talked about earlier, and the ISQ value is going to give them something that they can relate that experience to. And the neat thing is, is these implants are being restored in the same area, so they're getting feedback down the road of what happened with the implant that they placed. So there's no question, I, I feel, tying this ISQ into these young surgeons' hands and, 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 and learning the, the, the process of, of achieving better primary stability is, is definitely helpful. I've had cases where um, they didn't use a template, because we try to use templates on every case, but the template didn't work, and they're trying to be very still, and their ISQ is much lower than they, when they used a template. So templates are a big part of that process. But here's the, you know, one of those those straightforward cases, the, the, a patient that comes in with a single tooth that's asymptomatic, previously had endo done on it. I don't want, you, I don't want to make you feel that I, I just take teeth out to take them out. We try to save teeth when possible as well. But this one um, happened to be uh, what we call maximum resident benefit. The husband of one of our assistants um, is probably easier pathway to get an implant here. He was in a lot of pain. He's already invested money to try to save this tooth and it didn't work. And you could see at the apical 30 as some type of lateral lucency going on here. Maybe that's an accessory canal or something that's giving him an issue. Um, but he's sensitive to percussion. Uh, their thought is that the tooth pot potentially could be fractured as well. So we'll go through the process of removing this tooth, assessing the, the, the site. Um, we chose at this point to, to place an implant. You can see the implant's been placed. We have an 82 Ostel reading. So this is definitely one that is going through the process of being a very good one for immediate restoration. Um, we have a stable implant. We have a patient that um, we can control the occlusion on. We have the implant right through the central fossa. We already have a template done that gives us their vacuform matrix to make the provisional restoration. It's taken out of occlusion, out of excursive movements. And then um, once he goes through the healing process, uh, restored. Um, I would love to say we're doing these every week, but these come by every blue moon. This is not a, a common patient that we see in our practice, but at the time of impression, he was reading an ISQ of 80, which was eight weeks later, um, and then we proceeded with capturing the shape of the soft tissue with a customized impression coping technique. This is just a clear bite registration material that has composite flown around after it's impressed over the provisional, and now we have this this uh, impression coping and I'll transfer that shape to the technician so we can get a restoration in there that, that mimics the soft or supports the soft tissue um, adequately. So this is a screw retained restoration. We can run an ISQ down the road if, if need be, but we have those two values to hold on to. Uh, and he's six months out. Now for every one of his, we'll have a patient like this. This is a virgin tooth, first premolar split right in half. Happened to be my aunt. Uh, she blew it. She had no buckle plate. We grafted that site. So it was a big graft. And at, at the time, six months later, she comes in. And when I saw this, I said, you know, Aunt, Aunt Holly, I probably may be able to get a tooth on there for you today when we put that implant in. Um, so, you know, I was prepared for it. And we had some bone that we got in the site. And, and it, it, we used a, 
a tapered implant design that has kind of an aggressive thread pitch on it to help with stability. Um, but when the surgeon was placing, excuse me, when the surgeon was preparing the osteotomy, which was one of my partners, um, Luis Gonzaga, he's like, hey, this bone just feels really soft, really soft. And the placement torque on this was, um, I think it, it had to be sub 20. It was maybe 15 Newton centimeters. It was very, very easy to place. And the ISQ reading was 45 on it. So, you know, in a situation like this, we're going to pass. We're going to do, as Dennis Turnell says, one miracle at a time and just let that implant integrate. And when she came back um, at eight weeks, we had an ISQ value that was in the, um, uh, went from 40, it was like in the mid 50s. I waited a little bit longer. He put her in a provisional at 12 weeks and then, and then made the final restoration later. So. Those are the, that's where the ISQ plays a role um, because it did give us some good information at the time of surgery. Here's a more advanced case. This is a patient that has some health risk factors, um, would like to try to consolidate the treatment into a single stage um, uh, treatment. Um, he is unhappy with his dentures, they're really unstable, so he's looking for some more of a, a stabilized fit. Um, for those of you that are very comfortable with doing hybrid restorations, you're probably licking your chops now because we have beautiful ridges, nice attached tissue here. Uh, but with every one of these patients, when they come in with an inadequate set of dentures that don't dictate the ideal tooth position and so forth, we're going to get to the right spot and then work backwards. So this patient gets to a wax trying, gets the vertical dimension right, the lip support right, everything's correct, and then we do our workup. And this is a kind of tying a little bit of digital dentistry into what we're doing now um, in our practice. And you can see this is a double scan where we plan the implants. And I don't know if everybody in the room can see here, but there's an outline of the denture. Um, and then you see his ridge and, and the implants placed at an adequate vertical position to allow enough restorative space for our framework, our materials, and a stable set a prosthesis that's not going to give us problems. And you can see that ridge is kind of pointy and that implant's very subosseous, so we're going to have to remove bone. Where do we get our most stability with implants? We get it in the cortical bone, not the trabecular bone. So this is an actually important situation if we plan to do immediate loading because we need to have stable implants if we're going to give them a teeth. But at the same time, we don't want to sacrifice the space for the definitive restoration. So when we are do our digital planning, we can go into ut utilizing additive manufacturing to our advantage. This is, a this is a pretty neat template. It's a piggyback template. So this is actually what goes into the, onto the bone. This is used to seed it, and this is used to place the implants. And then this right here is going to dictate our bone reduction. So here you see the patient actually using his upper denture now to bite the, the template into place and then we do these lateral bone pins to hold it stable. So now we have the, the, the bone pins in place, the template's stable, we pull off that seating jig and we're going to remove this bone here. So when we remove that bone, obviously we've removed some cortical bone, so we're going to want to place implants that are going to have a, a, a thread pitch, thread design that's going to uh, kind of engage. Uh, that bone in a manner that hopefully maintains that stability. But using a CT guided approach is going to give us more precise osteotomies. It's going to take away from that vibration of free handing something. It's going to give us a more accurate fit of these implants. So we have the potential once these implants are placed to maximize that, that primary stability and eventually immediately load it. So you can see the Ostel reading there of a um, I gave you the lower number, 78, but uh, it was getting 81 from the mesial. So when we got numbers like this with Crotchar splinting, we chose to do immediate load on this patient. Take into consideration we're opposing a conventional denture. We're on a patient that's older than younger, um, so he's not going to be putting forces on there that are detrimental. So we could see that we have high stability tied to the Ostel scale here. So here we have the temporary copings in place, everything's sutured, the denture gets jumped, and then back in the laboratory we go through the process of removing the flanges and rounding things off so the patient can maintain it. And this is, I guess, we've been doing this for over 15 years, but it's kind of become kind of mainstream in our practices now. You hear people talking about immediate restoration, um, different types of techniques and getting patients into teeth quicker and in a functional manner. And, and the Ostel plays a nice key part of this whole process, especially, like I said, working with, with surgeons that are going through that, 
that evaluation process. So we have two week follow up. All right, so I have a, just a few more to share with you. This is where it gets kind of difficult because this is the type of patient, you know, Pam said the, I get a stomach ache. I don't get a stomach ache, I get acid reflux. I need Pepto-Bismol. I used to, I mean, I, I got no hair anymore. It's gone because of these patients. And it's a patient that has, you know, a history of implant failure. These are coming out, they're non-restorable. Uh, repeated augmentation. She smells like a chimney when she comes in. She has mixed dentition, opposing natural dentition down there. And she really needs something that stays in her mouth. Now, on a side note, if we were sitting down having a drink together, you'd say, Will, why don't you just get rid of them? I mean, you can be that iron fist and say, you can't have implants. You are a heavy smoker. And, and sometimes you probably need to do that. Um, but we got into dentistry to help people. And, you, and, you, and sometimes those lines get blurred. Uh, and it's difficult. Um, so I'm the, I'm the worst. I, can't, I don't know how to say no. Um, so, you know, I think we can, with us, maybe we can make it work. Well, here's the story. So we graft her bilaterally. We take out one of the implants. This is only there temporarily to help hold in the denture while the grafts are healing. She gets infected. We lose a portion of the graft because um, she's still smoking when she claims she wasn't. We get eventually to the implant placement. We do everything possible to give us the most accurate um, implant placement and stability by using CT guided surgery. We place the implants and look at these, these ISQ numbers. So in June, uh, we got a 41, 48, 31, 22. 22 is one of the lowest we ever saw. And sure enough, um, a few months later, it, it's out. We've lost number 22. Um, but actually look at the other ones. We got a drop in, in this implant here from a 41 to 32. This one goes up to 56, and then the 31 actually goes up to 43. And, and what I'm saying with these red numbers is uh, when I have a compromised implant, I'm trying to kind of work through. 44 is my, my, my number that I'm saying, you know, I think there may be a chance. Because in this study um, in 2014, they found 100% of the implants failed when the ISQ was 44 and did not improve. Uh, so that's kind of the number that I'm always shooting for. And you can see now we have the, this one's gone up to 61. This is improving to 48. Um, this one's gone up to 42 or back to right around 41. And now we're going to have to go through the process of trying to get another implant in there. But you know, the, 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 this is a very powerful t instrument to, to communicate to our patients. When I show these numbers, just like P Pam and Rachel said earlier, here, here you see these numbers. This is, they don't lie, this is what we're trying to achieve for you. Now my question is, this plays a big role in the prosthetic side of things. I mean, how do we, how do we choose to restore a patient like this? I hope that you wouldn't, you know, if we get these implants up into the low 60s, I, I hope you don't go with individualized attachments. We have to really seriously consider splinting these implants together, whether it's a unilateral or cross arch splinting. My preference is I actually would lean more to some type of cross arch prosthesis. And I was talking to Bob Vogel before this lecture, and he does a ton of conus prosthesis. And a conus is where you get your fixation in the framework of the prosthesis and not necessarily framework on the implants. And that may be a consideration in a patient like this. A conus is no, nothing like a, a locator type scenario. It's more of a fixed scenario that has a removal prosthesis. But what I'm trying to get across here is we need to splint these implants together. And one of the key things that we do on that is we always plan to the weakest link. Okay, I always look for arch form, V-shaped arches, much more difficult than U-shaped arches. Shallow palates are always going to have splinted implants versus deep palatal vaults where you can get some support and lateral stability. And then the implant stability, the ISQs are key factors in, in what we do there as well as the opposing occlusion. I mean, if I have a 95-pound, 80-year-old female opposing a denture, I'm going to probably take a little more risk in lower ISQ values than, than someone like myself. So let's, let's look at the big picture and tie it into these ISQ values read over, over time. All right, so I'm gonna end off on uh, a, 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 an evaluation situation. And this is a patient I've treated within the last three months that just breaks my heart. And, and if you want some validation in what you're doing in your practice to say, hey, I'm doing it the right way, this is a case that's gonna tell you that there's 
that, that, that um, you're doing well because I'm hoping none of you would approach treatment like this. This is a patient that <clears throat> had grafts placed, grafts, implants, and restoration in 2012. He spent over $60,000 for the, the restoration of these implants and, and the treatment. And after he had the prosthesis placed, he had persistent pain for close to a year in his maxilla, right up next to his nose. And he's like, I just have a lot of pain there. And he keeps going back to his dentist who placed the implants and restored the, these implants. And it's unresolved over a two-year period. He said he would keep going in there and he'd get a script for antibiotics. And there was never really anything done in the mouth, okay? So he would go in and the pain would go away and come back. And eventually he got fed up. He, you know, he confronted the dentist who kind of fired him and told him to go fly a kite. And so he then started seeking help elsewhere. Somehow he got, he saw two people who then just referred him directly to me um, because they didn't know what to do. And I'm really focusing, this is a different story. We're, we're focusing on this maxilla. And, and what you see here is acrylic resin denture teeth pink acrylic resin that's processed onto a framework that is cemented onto implants with panavia. Is that logical? Is that something that makes sense to you? It's a non-retrievable denture on these implants and this gentleman is in pain. How do you approach something like this? You know, so now we go through the process of having to retrieve this prosthesis. I spent a half a day cutting this denture off. Yeah, at the same time, you have to give them something when you're done as well, but we have to get this off. So if you ever have a scenario where you're trying to remove something that's cemented that you can't get to, what do you do? You go after the screw retaining screws. So we spent a lot of time dissecting, almost like that, almost looks like a Caldwell Luck approach, huh? Uh, going in here, this is, this is my surgery for the day, and then we isolate the framework, and then we work backwards from the framework. What was a very key tool that helped us in this were cross-sectional CTs. I used the CTs to kind of give me landmarks to kind of see where we can uh, uh, attack. But I was very, very fortunate that day. We were able to remove the prosthesis. We were able to clean it up, use these, screw, uh, these long rods to keep a patent screw access hole, and we'll make a, make, turn this thing into a screw retained prosthesis. It was amazing. That was, that was a, a good day for me, but I don't even know how you would charge for this. I lost my pants on this. I don't, I, there, where's the fee schedule for that? Um, so anyways, getting back to his implant health. Now I have a patient that obviously is going to be committed to me forever. Um, and he's like, what do I do? Well, you know, I know for a fact here that this implants failed because this was the symptom of all of his pain. And you don't need an, an ISQ value to tell you that that implant is coming out. So the first thing we did was we, we just took that implant out and um, he, he was 100% better within a week. Um, but now we have these other implants in place. What am I going to do with them? Because now we're going to have to rehabilitate this man. Do I want to use these implants? Do I not want to use these implants? And that's where I think um, we need to use our skill set and instruments to, to our advantage. So there's no question we'll look at these implants radiographically. Uh, but one of the key things you can do, and I don't know how much you do this when you follow up patients with implants, is palpate. Squeeze around implants. See if you get an exudate around them. I've had patients where the tissue's pink and healthy, and then you push on it, pus comes right up. And you're like, where did that come from? Right? So you're going to palpate uh, around these implants. We're going to probe to assess the health. We're going to be a very aggressive in determining the health of this implant. We're going to tap on it and get the ting sound, but we're going to also do an ISQ uh, measurement of these implants. And then before I proceed with anything, I'm going to get a reading later as well. Um, so we're going to try to get some history of ISQ on these implants and then tied to whatever implants we're going to do, we're going to build a process. But we're going to use this, this uh, resonance frequency to kind of assess some position of it. And well, an important thing to understand with, with these measurements, it's, it, they're not very powerful just at a moment in time. You need multiple measurements over time and, and, and some common sense to tie in with it. Um, but this is going to be a big investment on this patient's part. And you can see here, I was able to screw retain this back in. He left with his teeth that day. And at least I have something that's retrievable for the planning process. Okay, so I think I've, I've reached my limit here, but I want to share some key points here is, 
is anything in implant dentistry, we always want to plan for success. And we embrace wholeheartedly a restoration-driven approach. Everything is always in point backwards. It drives our augmentation, it drives our, plant, our implant positioning, it drives our loading protocols. And we always want to embrace techniques um, and tools that can help assess the, the health of the implant because quite honestly, that's our foundation um, for my passion, which is restorative dentistry um, and the longevity of these patients. Um, so ISQ measurements are, are a nice way to give us this information combined with our experience in, in treating these patients and not loading these implants too early that can send us in the wrong direction. So take multiple measurements over time and, and um, be up to date on the literature. And that, and that takes me to my next slide. I don't know if you've been to Austell's website, um, but in preparation for this lecture, I wanted to kind of hone in my skills. So I went to their website and they have a section on here called Knowledge Base. And when you go to that, there's, they have all their clinical guidelines there, but they have a whole searchable scientific database on all their publications. They have over 700 publications on this instrument. There's a, there's a lot of literature there that date back to, to Meredith's original um, studies on this, this instrument that you can reference right there on their website. And, and, and another instrument is the, they have an iPhone app. So if you're using it and you need to get a smart peg, I mean, the iPhone app will take you to this knowledge base as well. So with that, I, I want to thank Austell for having me up here. Thank Pam and Rachel for an awesome presentation. And, and I hope you all have a great AO meeting. The, the calendar looks great. So um, have a great day. Thank you.